So let me just tell you, if you can't already guess from the title, I've watched a lot of Chicken Girls. I watched 10 seasons, four movies, I read a book, and I've lost count of how many spinoffs I've watched at this point. So yeah, friends and family, that's, that's why you haven't seen me in weeks. Important, high-level stuff happening over here. See, a few years ago, Drew Gooden made two videos on this little channel called Brat TV, a channel built entirely off exploiting the built-in audiences of teen influencers. And at the time, I watched those videos and said, oh, haha, Drew, you rapscallion, and moved on with my life. That is, until recently, someone in my Twitch chat, Blue Star, you know who you are, suggested I make a video on the Chicken Girls. And at the time, I said, but oh, but has it Drew Gooden already made a video on the Chicken Girls? Surely there's nothing I could say that this formerly blue-haired freak hadn't already said. But no. It turns out Drew hadn't even scratched the surface of the insanity that is the Chicken Girls and Brat TV. Even though the most popular Chicken Girls episode has 39 million views, that's not enough. I will not rest until the entire world knows the lore of the Chicken Girls, as told by a 25-year-old YouTuber, as God intended. So sit back and let me tell you the story of the Chicken Girls and Brat TV. But first, in 1985, American journalist David Bloom was assigned to do a fluff piece on Emilio Estevez, who at the time was starring in St. Elmo's Fire, a soon-to-be hit film. And it would have stayed a fluff piece if Emilio Estevez hadn't done two unforgivable things. First, he insisted on getting two free movie tickets to Matthew Broderick's new movie, Lady Hawk, when the tickets only cost $6. Come on, Emilio, this little movie theater has a wife and kid at home. Won't someone please think of AMC? And second, Emilio apparently would not stop talking about how much he loves to hang out with his friend and do a alcohol. Can you even imagine a 23-year-old man enjoying such a thing? So Emilio took David to their local Hard Rock Cafe to hang out with him, Rob Lowe, Judd Nelson, and Jay McLarney. Perfect location, might I say. Too bad this wasn't in the 90s because then they probably would have done this at like Dick's Last Resort or Rainforest Cafe. And according to David, he had a pretty fun night out with these boys. To repay these boys for showing him a fun night, David decided to write an article about how these boys and their friends, most of whom weren't even there that night, are all selfish, untalented egomaniacs set to take over Hollywood. Their name? The Brat Pack. See, according to David, what distinguishes these young actors from generations past is that most of them have skipped the one step towards success that was required of the generation of Marlon Brando and James Dean, and even that of Robert De Niro and Al Pacino. Years of acting study. Do we think David saw Robert De Niro's hit film War with Grandpa in 2020? Young actors used to spend years at the knee of such respected teachers as Lee Strasberg and Stella Adler before venturing on stage, let alone in movies. You know, back in my day, we called them talkies. Can you imagine? He also took the time to gripe with the fact that not one of these actors even had a college degree. I mean, if they don't have a degree, what do they have hanging on their office wall? Do these kids even have offices? I can feel my youth slipping away and my wife will only touch me if risky business is playing on in the background. I mean, God damn it, Tom! Because the Brat Pack was not really a thing that, like, existed, it's not exactly clear who was a Brat Pack member. It was mostly just whichever hot young actors happened to star in one or two movies together. David Bloom does take the time to describe some of the members, though, including Nicolas Cage, who he calls the ethnic chair. <laughs> A nephew of Francis Ford Coppola, he changed his famous surname and took out Nightooth to play a leading role, Bertie, which made his reputation as an actor. His ethnic look usually lands him the part of the brother or best friend. Despite there being no women out at the Hard Rock Cafe that night, several famous women were also lumped into the Brat Pack, including Molly Ringwald, Ali Sheedy, and Demi Moore. Movies like The Breakfast Club, St. Elmo's Fire, of course, Sixteen Candles, and The Outsiders were all synonymous with the Brat Pack. And of course, it's not uncommon, especially in big blockbusters, for there to be frequent overlap in casting. I mean, sometimes a director just likes working with particular actors like John Hughes and Molly Ringwald, or Greta Gerwig with Timothy Chalamet and Saoirse Ronan. Or it's just two actors, especially together, are a big box office draw, like how Ansel Elgort and Shailene Woodley went from siblings to lovers to siblings again in the 2010s. I had to slightly adjust the frame so you can see this little lump over here. 
He's here. But David Bloom's article cast an insidious tone to this overlap between Brat Pack projects. These spoiled brats refuse to be in a movie without their besties in it. Did any of them say that ever? No, but some of them hung out at a Hard Rock Cafe one time when they weren't filming, so it must be true. And the release of this article ended up being devastating for many of the Brat Pack careers. They were actively encouraged to no longer hang out with one another, avoid working together, and if they wanted to be taken seriously again, they had to be entirely complicit to the older Hollywood executives who knew better than these young, entitled actors. I mean, the scandal of one Brat Pack member also meant scandal for all of them, even if they had not been associated with one another in years. <laughs> of course, now that it's the 21st century and these actors didn't single-handedly destroy Hollywood, the Brat Pack is a much more nostalgic and affectionate term for these actors. Movies like The Breakfast Club have a simple originality of self-contained and accessible story that is a lot harder to make these days. And now that these actors are themselves part of an older generation, people can finally acknowledge that, yeah, maybe they did have some like talent and did deserve some of the fame that they had in their peak. But even though that negative connotation has finally gone away from this Brat Pack name, it doesn't undo the emotional damage it caused for these actors. When talking about the Brat Pack label and its impact on the friend group, Ali Sheedy later said that the article just destroyed it. I had felt truly a part of something and that guy just blew it to pieces. So naturally in 2017, when two marketing executives, Darren Lochtman and Rob Fishman, had to come up with a name for their new network, which would center a group of young actors featured across multiple different projects, they decided to go with Brat TV. Perfect. Brat TV is a digital media network hosted on this very website, youtube.com, and are the creators of the one, the only, the Chicken Girls. Like a lot of media executives, they noticed that Gen Z was watching less and less cable television, instead opting for things like YouTube and Netflix. They saw a gap in the online market for high quality scripted content free and accessible on digital platforms like YouTube, and specifically geared towards young people. These two were also no strangers to working with Gen Z. Fishman's first company, which does not have any sort of description on his Wikipedia page, was sold to BuzzFeed in 2013. I like to think that he developed a proprietary code which could instantly tell you what kind of cheese you would be. Then they went on to co-found Niche, which from what I can tell was a social media site, kind of like LinkedIn, which would connect social media stars, more specifically Vine stars at the time, with major brands to post sponsored content. Niche was sold to Twitter in 2015 for $50 million, and Fishman wanted to make it very clear that he no longer has stock in Twitter. I'm still waiting for him to post his first thread. Rob, your silence is deafening. These guys also had prior experience producing content for YouTube. In 2016, they produced Alexander IRL, starring Brent Rivera, Jason Nash, and Nathan Kress, aka Freddy from iCarly, a nightmare blunt rotation if I ever saw one. That movie got 1.6 million views on YouTube, which seems like nothing compared to the 1.8 Billion views the Brat TV channel has amassed in just six years. Their most popular shows like Chicken Girls or Manny regularly get over 10 million views an episode. Some of you may be thinking, well, if they're so popular, how come I've never heard of it? I've never watched anything from Brat TV. I'm an intellectual. I'm too busy watching three hour deep dives on shows I've never watched. But Brat doesn't just have one channel. They've tried a few over the years, and right now it looks like they're making a cooking channel, which hasn't really taken off, but they are also behind Past Your Bedtime, which aims at a slightly older audience with podcasts by Dom, that one guy from Perfect Match, and Drew Afwalo. Trixie Mattel canonically exists in the Brat universe. I need you all to absorb that information. Now, it probably isn't hard to notice that there's a secret sauce behind the success of Brat TV, and it is not the quality acting or the immersive set design. No, Brat TV is entirely built around stunt casting. Most of the actors on Brat are either social media stars, the parents of social media stars, or the siblings of social media stars. One of my favorites was Rebecca Zamolo, the adult YouTuber who created her own awful expanded universe of children's content with the Game Master. Rebecca and you guys saw on Steven Shear's video that we are trapped in a jail right now. I found a magnet. 
we used our shoelaces to get a string and get a key. But the key just fell off the magnet, so we're gonna try to get it again so we can escape from the jail. She is one of the chicken parents. Family vloggers like Haley and Jules LeBlanc were the leads of multiple Brat TV projects. Of course, Dixie D'Amelio was famously on one season of Attaway General, only to disappear with no explanation after the first season. Brat TV has had not one, but three Dance Mom cast members. Charlie from Good Luck Charlie, someone from Dog with a Blog. Not the dog, though. They, they couldn't afford him. They even had Lila Buckingham, whose mom, Jane Buckingham, was convicted in the 2019 college admissions scandal. From a marketing perspective, this is, by all accounts, a very good business move. Fishman has very correctly said that despite these kids having bigger individual audiences than entire TV networks, social media stars are often treated like second-class citizens by traditional media outlets. Unlike the Brat Pack of the 1980s, Brat TV stars are actively encouraged to embrace their notoriety because these kids are social media stars. And because these kids are social media stars, they also have a direct line of communication to their audience where they can essentially market Brat shows for free. But because Brat almost exclusively casts based on social media following, and child actors are naturally less practiced and experienced than adult actors, you can't always expect Emmy-worthy performances from these kids. I'm so proud of you for how hard you tried. Thanks. You know, Ace invited me to this teen club, and he said a lot of girls are going to be there. Wait, what? Yeah, he really hyped it up. Why on earth are you telling me this? Um... And I mean, to me, these performances enhance the experience of watching Chicken Girls rather than detract from it. That being said, a lot, if not all, of the child actors improve a lot as the show goes on. Like, the leads of the Chicken Girls improve drastically from season one to season seven. I mean, Jules LeBlanc went on to star on a Nickelodeon show after season seven of the Chicken Girls. For one, they just grow up, they get more comfortable with the camera. Some of these kids are also just great right off the bat. I mean, Matthew Soto, Corinne Joy, and Paul Toa are all standouts to me. Although to my knowledge, none of those three were big social media stars before Brat. But you know, I'm not as hip with like, who the 15 year old influencers are these days. So I could be wrong and I'm fine with uh, that being a knowledge gap for me. What I'm trying to say is that even though I might poke fun at a line delivery every now and then, this is not going to be a two hour dunk fest on a bunch of children. So much of the show's goofiness really come from its writing, the editing, the directing, and yes, the adult executive's choice to make most of the cast 12 year olds who haven't acted before and are of course going to be a little awkward sometimes. They could have also made shows about older influencers right out the gate or been more mindful about casting based on acting ability but they didn't, and that's not these kids' fault. Don't be mean to these kids, or kids generally, I guess. All right, now that I've taken the brave stand against bullying children, let's finally get into the Chicken Girls, because that is what this video is about, in case we all forgot. The Chicken Girls is the flagship show of Brat TV. It currently has 10 seasons, four movies, three direct spin-offs slash limited series, and The Chicken Girls has a fairly similar format to Degrassi. It's a show about a bunch of kids doing middle school and high school things, and there's drama, there's boyfriends, there's 10 new kids every semester, and half of those new kids disappear, never to be heard from again next semester. That's, that's the gist. I don't know how many seasons the writers originally planned for The Chicken Girls. I mean, I don't know who sets out to make 10 seasons of a continuous story period, but any central premise that they had for the show got abandoned by season three. But alas, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. I said before this video is not gonna be a dunk fest on children. This video is also not going to be a play-by-play -play of each episode or even of each season of Chicken Girls because there is simply too much content and too many dropped storylines for that to even make sense. What I will do is explain the plot of season one, which I think will give you a good sense of why no one needs a synopsis of each season. From season one, we can, we can zoom out and talk about aspects of the series as a whole. Sound good? All right. But we have a brief interruption for today's sponsor, Bright Cellars. Bright Cellars is a wine subscription service that believes anybody can experience the joy of wine. Each month, Bright Cellars provides a curated wine collection based on a quick seven question quiz, which of course asks what kind of wine you normally like, but also, what kind of food do you like? How adventurous are you? You then choose from 12 different plan options and get over 100 varieties of wine sourced from over 80 regions across the world. Each box also comes with wine education cards, which is perfect for people like me because all I really know about wine is that you like swirl it, 
Maybe, but these wine education cards will outline tasting notes, suggest pairings, the best serving temps, and of course tell you where the wine is from. With Bright Cellars, your satisfaction is guaranteed. They have over 600,000 five-star reviews, and if you don't like a bottle, they will replace it. I've been really loving it because I'm not super picky with wine, but I also don't know how to pick for myself. So it's been really fun every week when we watch The Bachelorette to have like a different wine bottle for me and my friends to try. So thank you to Bright Cellars for giving my followers their first six bottle subscription, which is normally $150 for just $60. Click the link in the description and get started today. Thank you again to Bright Sellers for sponsoring this video and thank you to everyone who checks them out. You know, sponsorships help me do what I do. So if you check it out, you're supporting me and getting some great wine. All right, and back to the video. The show centers around four girls, three childhood best friends, Rhyme, Quinn, and Ellie, and their new friend Kayla, who Ellie met over the summer at dance camp. Rhyme, Quinn, and Ellie are the chicken girls, which the show calls their ship name, but they are, they're not in the thruple, they're just friends. And you might be thinking, why are they called the Chicken Girls? Well, there's this song they all like to listen to from the 80s. The song doesn't actually say anything about Chicken Girls, but it does have a lot of aviary and friendship themes, so I guess somehow the name came out of that song. We fly so high, we fly together, fly together. we are a girl gang like birds of a feather. And the Chicken Girls all have this cute little dance that they do to this song, and you know I've got the routine down. I, we fly together, we are a girl gang like birds of a feather. The Chicken Girls and Kayla all want to try out for their school dance team, but there are only three spots. But actually, the number of spots on this dance team is a mystery to me because Rooney and Birdie are the two co-captains of this dance team. Side note, Rooney is Quinn's older stepsister. But in the early episodes, there are also two other random girls on the dance team, which would mean that there are seven spots on the team. But those two random girls disappear without explanation by episode four. So the number of spots on this team is only important when the plot demands it to be. But whatever, three spots on the team. Kayla, Ellie, Quinn all make the team in Sorry Rhyme. No dance team for you. So already you can see what feels like a pretty classic high school sitcom drama premise. Three close friends now have a new person hanging around and is that fourth person going to be a part of the squad? Are they going to replace Rhyme with their new friend? Are Rhyme and Kayla going to get along? Are they going to have conflict? Who is Rhyme without dance team? See, you would think that that's where they're going to go, but the writers of Chicken Girls had this habit you'll notice very early on and will not improve over time, where they forget the stakes that they establish even in a previous episode or previous scene. They decide they want to do a different storyline only to have that different storyline also be later abandoned and replaced, and so on and so forth. So of course, Kayla becomes an official chicken girl by episode three without really any comment from Rhyme. And by episode four, Rooney decides that she doesn't want to be on the dance team anymore. So Rhyme gets to be on the dance team. Get to practice. Practice what? Painting your signs? You're on the team. What? Why, how? Rooney chose the school newspaper over us. She's done. But. She want the spot or not? That's what I thought. All four of them are on the dance team. All four of them are chicken girls. So from there on out, it's as if Kayla has been their friend this entire time. All right, cool, it has been four episodes and we have pretty much resolved all of the drama that we established in the pilot episode. What are we doing now? Well, it turns out that there is a rival dance team of semi-professional girls ranging from nine to 16 called Power Surge, and they are their biggest competition. And oh no, Quinn has joined Power Surge. Was there any foreshadowing that that would happen? Uh, I mean, no, not really. And this is the team you need to beat. Power Surge. And at first, I assumed that maybe Quinn had transferred schools to join this team, or that this team of semi-professional dancers existed outside of the school teams that competed against each other. But no, the Power Surge girls just also go to the Attaway school. There's two dance teams. You know, every school needs two dance teams, not JV and varsity. Uh, one good and one evil dance team. So this is as close to a central plot that we get for the first two seasons of Chicken Girls, competing against their nemesis Power Surge to win the championship and be the best dancer. How do we say this without dunking on a bunch of 14 year olds. It's not that they're all bad dancers. They're just not My Little Kendall. Woo! Woo! Yeah. I don't know why 
there's something just really funny about the show being premised on like high stakes competitive dancing and everybody is just okay at dancing. I mean, I guess I don't know what the standards are for 13 year old competitive dancers. Maybe this is actually more realistic. I think I'm just so used to shows like Dance Moms where yes, you're mostly watching that show for Abby to yell at children and for Kelly to learn who Anne Frank is. But part of the appeal is watching how genuinely talented all of these girls are. Or Glee, where everyone has an amazing voice, or at least can be auto-tuned to have a decent voice. Are those shows realistic? No. But part of the fun of those shows is watching these really impressive performances. And the high-level performances make the stakes feel more important because it's like the best of the best competing against one another. I found an interview from years later with Jules LeBlanc, who played Rhyme, and she said that they did have a choreographer in season one, but that sometimes the girls would just like make up their own dances. Well. Oh my god, wait. <laughs> Guys, um, we made up that dance. We had like 30 minutes available just for funsies. And I don't know if we didn't like the choreography that they gave us or there wasn't any. I don't really know what went down. But long story short, Dylan ended up choreographing a dance for us and we all did it. And these are 13 year old girls who don't dance outside of acting on this show. And choreographing is also just an entirely different skill than dancing itself. Plus I'm sure they're hot and tired from being on set all day. I mean, you can't expect dance mom's quality moves from these girls. But the fact that choreographing good dance routines was a total afterthought in the show all about dance teams is so emblematic of the uh, Brat TV production. Because this is a tween drama, we also have plenty of boy drama. TK is Rhyme's best friend, and at the time, these 12-year-old actors were dating in real life, which led to a very strange but substantial niche of fan edits, fan fictions, endless shipping content of these two real-life children. But anyways, in the show, as you can imagine, they are childhood best friends, and they have this constant will-they-won't-they they thing going on. Are you guys, like, together? Never really thought of it that way. I do miss our bike rides on the beach and laying under the stars at night. One time she spilled ice cream in her hair and then the bee swarmed her and she jumped in the pool with all her clothes on. That's uh, very specific. <laughs> That's probably the best day of my life. But Ryan starts dating this guy, Tim Sharp. Oh, I'm Tim Sharp. You know, Kayla's much older, cooler cousin. How much older Tim Sharp? She's 12. But even when she's dating Tim Sharp, she gives very subtle hints that actually, she likes TK. I got you something. Aw, did TK tell you to give me this? TK, what? The T stands for Tim. Tim and Ryan? TK and Tim have this rivalry the entire season, and so they battle it out on the swim team. And of course, they practice for the swim team with no swim cap, no goggles, no competitive swimsuits, no lane dividers, no lifeguard, and no coach. I love this show. This rivalry also introduces us to Flash and Ace, TK's two friends. Now we can finally finish our D&D &D campaign. Where did we leave off? Caves of More Doom? Weren't you a goblin wizard? Ooh, goblin wizard? Who's this nerd? Ace, this is Flash. Dungeon master and comrade. Kindergarten best friend. We haven't seen each other in a while. And this is Ace. So It's a pleasure to meet you. Whatever. Honestly, the TK Ace Flash stuff takes up a lot of screen time, but other than some one-off lines, there's really not much to say about this plot line. Hey, Hamilton. You lost like 600 quarters today. You're gonna go broke. Nah, my uncle got me a Bitcoin for my birthday. It's worth like $15,000 now. What's a Bitcoin? It's like Monopoly money but only old people think it's real. My dad always tells me, sell your video games and invest in Bitcoin. Crazy, man. I'm already getting ahead of myself, but I can't help it. While we're on the subject of TK, in season two, they established that TK is into filmmaking. And I just want to show you how they introduce this character trait. Okay, so TK is in LA with Flash, visiting Flash's dad, who is a famous movie director. For crying out loud. My AD just called in sick. She was probably out partying late last night. What's an AD? Son, you strike me as a sharp kid who knows how to read a schedule. How'd you like a job? It's funny because 
realized that's actually exactly how I got my license to practice law. What's a court? You seem like a smart kid with your finger on the pulse. How would you like to sue people? But back to season one, we also have the romance between Rooney and Hamilton, one of my personal favorite characters. Can you guys be adults somewhere else? I need to get my chemistry book. Jelly bean? It just feels good as someone with bad posture and strange energy to finally see myself represented on screen. Rooney Forrester pranked me. I hate Rooney Forrester. Wait, am I in love with Rooney Forrester? After Rooney gives Hamilton a cupcake which makes him throw up, they fall in love and he sings with the ukulele outside of her room. The toxic gossip train. My personal nightmare, but good for them. Ellie is the boy crazy one of the group, so of course she also has her fair share of boy drama in the first season. At first, she likes this boy Henry. What are you doing here? What do you think I'm doing here? Are you here to do the makeout? Until she finds this random British guy just in a classroom and sniffs his jacket. Oh, up your hoodie's ripped. Hey, take mine. And when you're watching Chicken Girls for the first time, as I was, and you see this British boy, you may have this false sense of security that this isn't a musical. After all, this is episode six, and there's been nothing up to this point to indicate that the show is indeed a musical. Yeah. Throughout the first few episodes, Ellie is always singing to everyone's apparent delight. Summer dreams ripped out the sea. Yep, ring a bell. Yeah. No. It feels like everyone's moving on with their lives, but I'm just stuck. Listen up, yeah, listen to me. My girls, my fam, my family. Stronger numbers. It's then, when she's heartbroken over Henry and again sees random British boy, she bursts out into full song. I used to hope Personally, I think all media should follow this format. Like the twist at the end of Game of Thrones season one isn't Ned Stark getting beheaded, it's that he has the voice of an angel. I used to hold you in a higher regard. Ellie is singing and is framed as though this is non-diegetic, meaning this isn't heard by the other characters. This is just an expression of her inner dialogue through song. Harvey is playing guitar, but there's a full band back in track. She's slamming lockers, she's throwing her arms out. You assume that Harvey, in the canon of the story, isn't actually seeing this. I'm on to the next crash. Hey, you're a Pretty good. Okay, so I guess he was seeing it. Then Ellie has to choose between being on the dance team and becoming a pop star. So Ellie ditches one of their dance performances against Power Surge, and I think that was honestly the right call. Because Birdie tricks the other Attaway dance team girls into using Power Surge's choreography, but they go after Power Surge and they do a really bad job at it. This plan was not thought out very well. I did not realize until I was done editing, but Birdie is played by Mads Lewis, and she is the source of this iconic TikTok meme. Yeah, I'm fine. Um, I don't know. Oh my god. So there's more drama. Yeah. I uh, found out this morning that Jaden likes Nessa, so. Yeah. Just as for Mads, she's in a relationship now. She seems to be doing much better, so I'm sorry that I'm laughing at a child. I think she's fine now. I hope she's fine. <laughs> they are at least able to get Quinn back from Power Surge, and they let those Power Surge girls have it. Luna, I quit. See you all at the dance meet tomorrow. But then, the regionals qualifier is the same night as Ellie's big concert. Ellie is going to have to decide where her loyalties lie, even though she technically already ditched the dance team to sing. But for real this time, Ellie, pick a side. But then, they decide to just have Ellie sing live while the chicken girls dance in the competition, which, I'll just say, seems fundamentally unfair that the chicken girls get to supplement their performance with like a live band, but whatever. The chicken girls win, TK says that he loves rhyme, and that is it. That is season one. You know, there is a certain charm to season one. Maybe it's all of the kids pretending to play arcade games. I mean, they use this shot not once, but twice. 
the nerve. Or maybe it's how they clearly can't afford to pay adult actors to be in the show. So any adult who is visible instantly makes up an excuse to be off screen immediately. So you moved to Michigan. I did, but my mom got transferred back and here I am. Great, my work's done. I'll be in the supply closet if you need me. There is still so much of the show I need to talk about. And so, a la Jenny Nicholson, let's go through some of the best, worst, and wildest aspects of Chicken Girls through a numbered list and in no particular order. Number one, the production quality. This show is an odd experience because most of it is shot in 4K. I imagine they're not getting Disney salaries, but it cannot be cheap to book the whole Addison Rae clan to be on your show. And like I said, these shows get millions of views with peak, brand-friendly, child-friendly CPM. At least after the first season, you know they have the money to make a decent quality production. But every once in a while, you'll get a character like this guy, Leo's dad. He's in the army. Can't you tell? Oh, and this character, Leo, rides a bike, just like a normal bike. But they want to give the impression that he's like a bad boy motorcycle guy, this bike being 12. So they just put a motorcycle sound effect over the shot of Leo walking with a normal bike. It's you! I mean, the bike I've been hearing. Or sometimes the prop plane ticket will just be like a handwritten piece of paper. Most of these set windows don't have a background, so you get the impression this entire show just takes place in heaven or some void in space and time. There are also multiple times where the sound editing is just absolutely insane. I mean, warning to headphone users for this next clip. See ya. There's another sequence where the Millwood, uh, the rival school and Attaway teams are having a dance battle and it goes from again really loud out of place music to just total silence at one point. Oh, I love a good old fashioned dance hall. They don't even try to make the music sound like it's playing from a speaker in the environment. I mean, if I'm clocking the audio quality, it, it can't be good, right? <laughs> okay, so when I was watching the show for the first time, I was just watching the marathons where Brat TV has put together the entire seasons. And when I went back to pull these clips, I watched the individual episodes and I noticed that the audio actually sounds fine when you watch the individual episodes. It's only on these marathons where it sounds super weird. And I realized that they got copyright claimed and this is like them, them dubbing it over with generic copyright free music after the fact, which, you know, hey, that's happened to me before. But I do think it's interesting that this also seems to happen with big production companies and they still, you know, they haven't fixed it at any point. So just a little, little interesting tidbit for you. The show also loves to use some wild stock footage that is nowhere close to the settings they're actually using. One of my favorites is in season seven when the oldest characters are graduating. They don't even have the individual characters walk across the stage with like crowd noise in the background. It is all generic stock footage. Welcome to the Attaway High School commencement ceremony for the class of 2020. Class of 2020. You're telling me that this man with this hairline just graduated from high school? One of my other favorite things to look for in these shows is that when these characters are canonically supposed to be in middle school, they will just be fully adult extras sitting in the classroom with them. Who let this man in here? You know when Haunting of Hill House and Bly Manor came out, everyone loved rewatching that show to see all the ghosts that were placed in the background or the crazy one-shot scenes where an entire mansion set had to be built. Chicken Girls has this same rewatch appeal for like the totally opposite reason. There are so many little production details that you might miss that just constantly add to the chaos of the show, which is something you'll grow to both love and hate about watching it. Number two, the music. For the rest of season one and two, Ellie is pursuing a professional pop career. You were flat the entire time. And what was with that raspy thing? Which I guess she retires from by season three. And so intermittently, she'll sing a little song, but she isn't the only one. Right after Ellie sings her locker slamming song, in the very next episode, Harmony, Rhyme's little sister, Harmony, Rhyme can get it, is like, Rhyme, won't you sing for me? And Rhyme is like, oh, I don't know. Okay, hit it. I don't know what to do. You could play me a song. For 
what it's worth. I hope we can be more. By the way, they basically have this scene not once, but twice. You are wise beyond your years. Can you sing me a song? Sure. For what it's worth. I hope we can be more. It very much reminds me of the early 2000s Disney Channel model, where a lot of these songs are meant to be launching points for these young actors' pop careers alongside them acting on the show. And for the most part, these moments where the characters are singing make sense. They're diegetic. You understand why they're singing in that moment. You'll have a character singing at church. The Overnights band will be singing at a concert. Those are times when singing would be expected, except when they're not. Like the time the chicken girls need to practice for state because they are dangerously behind and have been majorly flopping up to this point. Uh, so naturally they sing a song about how it's girl time. Hey girls, shouldn't we be practicing? Probably. Yeah, okay. But wouldn't it be like way more fun? Don't say it, Ellie. <laughs> Just here we go again. And also there's a chicken boy here too, but he's down for it, so it's all good. In season three, there really aren't that many songs and you almost think that they've forgotten to incorporate music until this scene in season four, where Rhyme and Rooney are very annoyed with the men in their lives and Luna just wants to sing with them. Even though Ty is a literal saint, I have to admit that boys for the most part, kind of suck. Can I get an amen? Amen. I'm just so over it. I don't get up in the morning just to see you. And I'm pretty sure that that is the last song in the show. The rest of the series is not a musical, but at any moment, I'm waiting for them to bring it back. You can never feel safe. Number three, the boys of the week. Of course, we cannot forget the most important part of the Chicken Girls boy drama. You know, unlike other teen high school shows like Degrassi or Glee, the Chicken Girls doesn't focus too much on like darker themes or like huge external forces with the characters. Or they might for an episode, but then get bored. There is an episode where one of the characters briefly gets into debt with the mob, which sounds dramatic, but most of the drama is Robbie is just sad that Ellie broke up with him, you know, because of like the whole mob thing. And that's all resolved within three episodes. There's no school shooter arc. There's no resurrecting Satan or whatever happens on Riverdale. I mean, I lost track of that show a long time ago. The drama Chicken Girls can consistently deliver is boy drama relationship drama. I would say the boys on this show are very much like the villains in a cartoon Batman series. Sure, you have your TK, your Hamilton, your Joker and Riddler, respectively, but they can't all stand out. You've got your villain of the week, just like the Chicken Girls had their boys of the week. Without fail, there is at least one boy introduced each season who in all likelihood will be unceremoniously written off, off screen, by the time the next season runs around. The best is when there is no in-universe explanation, they are just gone. And again, because these are often young social media kids who haven't acted for a long time, haven't acted at all maybe before they were on Chicken Girls, and they're not on the show long enough to improve their acting abilities, a lot of the boy characters have that same energy as that one football character everyone's English teacher just couldn't get enough of. I can't believe it's really you, Asya. We don't have much time, Scarrett. I know this, but I choose a single moment with you over over an eternity with anyone else. Cut. That was great, guys. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, Jax, I'm so sorry. That was totally my fault. I will not let you take credit for my clumsiness. Glad to see you committed my name to memory, though. So I'll just keep almost bumping into your own school then. And again, it's probably not great in terms of improving the show's overall quality but it does enhance the experience for me personally. But I did say earlier that Matthew Soto and Paul Toa were two of the stronger actors on the show, and I do stand by that. They also last a lot longer than most of the boys on this show and are around for several seasons. Matthew Soto plays Robbie Robbins, the son of evil music producer Robin Robbins. No one on the show has real names and I need you all to learn this now. As I said, he briefly gets caught up with the mob. I mean, happens to the best of us, but for the most part, he's just like a nice boyfriend to Ellie until season six when he's on tour the whole time. Guys, I'm picking up a phone ring. Cut. I'm sorry, guys, it's long distance. Ro Robbie, I, I can't, oh my. 
because again, the writers don't really know how to give a character an arc so that it makes sense when they leave inexplicably. <laughs> Paul Toa plays Ty, who dates Luna on the show, one of the Power Surge girls. His plotline is actually kind of interesting because he's injured, he used to be a big football star until he couldn't play. Luna invites him to his church and he goes despite not being religious himself. He then talks with Luna's dad, the pastor, and has a realization. You playing again? Not this, nah. I wish. I'm actually the team manager now. Talking to your dad really clarified that for me. I'm happy for you. I was hoping that you would join Praise. I sort of thought... Praise was cool and all. It was just... It really showed me that religion isn't for me. And I want to channel my passions into what I care about. Which is football? Don't sound so disappointed. Yeah, Jesus is cool, but ever heard of football? One of my favorite boys of the week is Drake. He dates Rhyme and Rooney. Not at the same time. The actor who played Bruni started dating the actor who played Drake in real life, so they had Rhyme and Drake break up and Bruni and Drake get together on the show. Besides the point, Rhyme meets Drake in her theater kid era when they are in the school play Rodeo and Juliet, a new country take on a classic love story. And first of all, because he is the lead of this high school play, they treat him like a celebrity. Drake, right? From the musical? Nope, oh, that's me, but I still have to go to class like everyone else. Yeah. Most unrealistic part of this entire show, to be honest. But also the casting is especially bad with this one because he is the least animated theater boy I've ever seen. Well, that's basically it. Next week we'll be watching Phantom, so I'll see you guys next week. How was Drama Club? Well, we're in a stalemate on whether to do Hairspray or Pippin. I just don't think this group can handle Fosse choreography. Now that I'm not on the dance team. Wait, wait, she can dance and sing? Can't she do? Trust me, a whole lot. <laughs> well, I'm glad you stepped out of your comfort zone. Yeah. The theater's glad to have you. I really wish they'd kept him around longer. Just a minute. It's dancing. Yeah. Here's a thought. What if when she says cowboy, she does curtsy and like this? I love it. I this fully counts as a boy of the week because he's not a romantic interest like most of the other boys, but he is another one of my personal favorites, so I have to mention him. Arthur is introduced as Rhyme's partner in a home ec project where they have to care for a flower baby. Did anyone actually have to do this assignment in school or does this project solely exist for children's sitcoms? But he's just another kid where anytime he said something, I immediately wrote in my notes because I could not let myself forget. You don't want to listen to my boy problems. Living vicariously through other people's problems is like one of my favorite hobbies. Besides eating frogs. Huh? Nothing. Pick a topic, any topic. Did you really eat a frog in bio last semester? You have the long story or the short story? Short, definitely short. And you know, to the Chicken Girls writer's credits, these are clearly jokes. And yeah, they, they made me laugh, there you go. I heard that all the water fountains are laced with ADHD medication. Number four, the movies. It's just like the movies. A wee mantra. After marathoning the first two seasons of Chicken Girls, I could not wait to dive into season three. And suddenly, there's all this stuff in the previously on Chicken Girls I do not recognize, and I know. I didn't just forget things. The first two seasons are permanently seared into my brain. I could quote them in their entirety line for line. I just won't do it right now. But it turns out I had completely forgotten about the movies. There are four official Chicken Girls movies, which basically act like another season of the show if the season had a more consistent plotline throughout. The Chicken Girls actors actually had no notice that they were making a movie for the first time. They finished filming season one and were handed a new script, assumed it was for season two, and they found out, oh no, we're, we're making a whole movie now, sure. The first Chicken Girls movie was originally created as part of a deal with Studio L, which is a digital content division of Lionsgate. But the deal between Lionsgate and Brat TV had already fallen through by the time the film was released. But there are still hints that a major production team was helping out with this particular movie. For one, there are several more traditional Hollywood actors, which are noticeably much more comfortable doing character work. We have Melanie Paxson, who plays the hardened principal who wants to ban dancing and fun from the school in favor of standardized testing. But even better, we have Adrian Armante, Esteban, from Sweet Life on Deck, who plays Senor Singer, and would you believe he is the most delightful part of this movie? It was a tie. So, you will perform together. Um, no comprendo? Yeah, it never made sense why we have two dance teams anyway. So, problem solved. 
You dance together. We demand a recount. Well, I'm the only voter. And I declare, it is a tie. Listen, mister. You want to speak to your boss? <laughs> my boss? Be my guest. <laughs> the movie is about how all of these kids love dancing and singing as established by this opening musical number. I'm dancing on the ceiling. Rhyme, that's physically impossible. Close gravity. Kayla, it's a metaphor, you know, for feeling alive. Exactly. Something has come over me. Got all the feels. I still cannot tell whether this movie is a musical. I think it technically is. There is another scene where Ace is singing what I can only describe as teen musically influencer music. Hit it. Rhyme starts singing Stay partway through. The rest of the movie has not been a jukebox musical. The rest are original songs. I don't have an explanation for that. But anyways, new principal is like, hey, I don't like this singing and dancing. I'm banning all of this so everyone can study for their standardized tests, which she calls the test test. In a practice test with a state exam, you might call it a, uh, a test test. That has a nice ring to it, ma'am. Thank you, Sheldon. She also has the sidekick Sheldon, a character who, of course, we have not seen before and will not see again in the Chicken Girls canon. The Chicken Girls then team up with Power Surge to get Senor Singer to seduce the principal at an old folks' home, where one of the girls is in disguise as an old woman. That plan works, but you have to still pass the test test, go to the dance. Rhyme fails the test test, blames her nine-year-old sister because they spent all their time on this scheme to like seduce the principal, so Rhyme had no time to study. Bunny wanted to see how you were doing. Well, I would be doing a lot better if their friend Harmony wouldn't have made me fail the test test. Wait, you failed the test because of me? Exactly, I wasted so much time on your master plan that I didn't study for the test test. Well, maybe next time don't take advice from a nine-year-old. That's one lesson I've definitely learned. And she's like, you say, here where I want to. Rhyme decides she's disguising herself to go to the dance. She gets caught immediately, but the principal is like, well, you did fail the test test, but eh, have fun, kid. You'll never see me again anyways. Then at the end of the movie, TK reveals that he is going away for the summer with Flash to study at a film program in Hollywood. Ash's dad invited us to LA this summer so we could teach him how to be a real director. The whole summer? Well, yeah, but we can tax and stuff. Rhyme storms off emotionally. TK says, wait. So much for happily ever after. Wait. I love this shot because you can see that she's clearly just standing waiting for TK to call her back and boom, they kiss. This review from Poner39106 really captures how I feel about the Chicken Girls movie better than anyone could. Sheldon Kilpatrick single-handedly carries this movie so well. He makes the movie a cinematic masterpiece, it by far one of the best films in history. Kilpatrick's performance is just beyond amazing. Even though the kids just think of him as the teacher's pet, the audience knows he is the real puppet master behind everything. The principal? No, Sheldon is beyond such a role of principal. No actor will ever outdo his work in the film, except maybe himself. Next, we have the Holiday Special, which is a crossover of multiple Brat TV shows. This one's pretty skippable, although this movie has Jules LeBlanc and Kenzie Ziegler of Dance Moms in the thumbnail smiling together. And what's interesting about that is, as I mentioned, Jules LeBlanc and Hayden Summerall, TK, were dating off screen, and people were very invested in these children's relationship. I mean, presumably these were all children fans as well, but still strange. One day, Hayden Summerall posts a picture of him getting kissed on the cheek by Kenzie Ziegler, and the jewel shippers just lost their minds. Hayden, being a 12 year old, wasn't even confirmed to be dating Jules or Kenzie at the time. Children just assumed that he cheated and he had to release a public statement. I don't know if there was ever real drama between Kenzie and Jules, but there was certainly fan force drama. You were either team Jules or Team Kenzie. They don't interact in this movie. They have one scene at the end where they randomly take a selfie together. But Brett 
chose to make that the thumbnail of this movie, probably because they knew how much drama and speculation surrounded these two children and their relationship with another child, Hayden Summerall. And how sick and twisted is that? I mean, Jules herself has talked about how when she was a kid, she was terrified that adults interviewing her were going to ask her about her and Hayden. You know, I can give a pass to the immature young fan base for having these toxic attachments to these ships, but the adults actively profiting off of this? Just bleh. Eh. You know? But anyways, the two brat movies you actually do have to see for the plot of Chicken Girls to make sense are Spring Break and Intern in Chief. I, however, did not realize I needed to watch these movies because I wasn't watching the show as everything premiered. And so I finished season three and Drake and Rhyme were in this happy relationship. Next thing I know in season four, she's obsessed with this British guy who she met over spring break. And I was like thoroughly confused, but you need to watch spring break in between seasons three and four and Intern in Chief between seasons four and five just in case any of you wanted to binge this children's show as well. So let's talk about Spring Break. First of all, this movie starts with an ad for a movie tie-in lip gloss. Sadly, it doesn't look like they sell these anymore. I can't review them for you today, but we are already starting off strong with my fave Drake, who is upset about hanging out with Rhyme's friends and just wants to listen to some Wicked. Ski trip, more like ski lit, am I right? Doesn't really rhyme, but I dig the enthusiast. Yo, can you guys keep it down? I'm right at the good part of Wicked. She's defying gravity. Drake and Rhyme break up while this extra just stares Drake down. This is ridiculous. I'm gonna go get a chai tea and probably listen to something calming like Phantom. Somehow some pre 9-11 shenanigans in a post 9-11 world happens and Rhyme accidentally gets on a flight to Miami instead of the skiing place she was going to. And she ends up staying with new characters, Effie, Zoe Valentine, and Autumn. Autumn is the other one. They all end up at this fancy Miami resort where British boy Ezra is flirting with Rhyme. I really like watching Rhyme pick up this croissant. This is my favorite part of the movie. Ezra's dad is about to marry his stepmom in a few days. So naturally the stepmom hires these children to help her plan her wedding. Again, happening in a few days. And that's pretty much the gist of the movie. Rhyme breaks up with Drake. She gets Ezra's number. She's loving her new lip gloss. Then we start season four and Ezra hasn't texted her back and she is Pissed. Why? It's no big deal. You just got ghosted. I did? One day here, next day gone. Yes, I should just delete his number and pretend we never met. Jeez, that guy Ezra sounds like a real jet. I'm Arthur, and you must be Ezra. Guess my reputation precedes me. And it certainly does. You had a chance with Ryan. As you can see, we have a family together. And it turns out. Ezra is a bit of an incel. He writes a story about how the girls are protesting home ec for enforcing dated gender stereotypes. So would you call yourself a feminist then? Uh, yeah. You know what, yeah, yeah I would. Okay, thanks Rhyme, I think I've got a winning. He implies that Rhyme and her protest are destroying the nuclear family. And you write that disgusting article about how women belong in the kitchen. That's not what I wrote. You said that the feminist movement has gone too far and that without stay-at-home moms, the nuclear family will collapse. And I stand by that. Women don't need to stay at home, but it's not a bad thing if they do. You literally told me you agreed with me and then wrote the exact opposite. That's called getting the story. Then when Ezra is investigating why the hallways stink so much, Rhyme figures out that it's because Flash and Ace earlier were keeping their old BLTs in a supply closet right next to the air conditioning vent. Because Rhyme uncovered the story and is a really good writer, because she's a writer now, she doesn't dance anymore, she gets to cover the news instead of Ezra. And again, Ezra is pissed. Thanks Rhyme, I can take it from here. Actually, this was Rhyme's scoop. Rhyme, it's your article if you want it. I would love to write it. From Rhyme the Reporter. Why do you say it like that? You knew I was chasing this story. And you swiped it from under me again. And of course, Tim's gonna side with some cute girl over some dude. I don't get up in the morning just to see you. The show then explains at home, Ezra's stepmom has become abusive towards him. And Ezra has the realization that these unhealthy attitudes he has towards women, gender roles, and relationships generally is because he didn't have a healthy role model of those dynamics growing up and he needs to improve these things about himself. Genuinely, season four is one of the best seasons of the Chicken Girls. This is a whole other aside. I mean, they introduce nuanced plot lines about 
feminism, how abused people become abusers and how they can break those patterns. The humor in season four is much stronger than in past seasons. The actors are much better than in past seasons. Also, everyone in season four keeps saying that Hamilton got hot and now he's hashtag hot ham. Hashtag hot ham. You heard it here first, ladies. And you think that's just like a random bit, but it's actually foreshadowing a plot line in the next movie and the beginning of season five. I mean, this is the season where the writers learned about setup and payoff. So then as we've established, I made the same mistake again. I started watching season five and suddenly Ezra is gone, even though they did not resolve his abusive stepmom plot line. And Hamilton is gone because suddenly he's a supermodel called Jared Danger. Are you sure it's him? Of course I'm sure. But it says Jared Danger. That's his stage name. Tim Sharp, a main character for the first four seasons, is gone with absolutely no reference. No one is acknowledging that he was ever there. Did he even exist? But of course, I had forgotten. I needed to watch the crucial film, Intern in Chief. Effie from Spring Break makes her return and her aunt runs the fashion magazine, Trey Chic. And of course, Effie, Rhyme, and the other teen influencers are tasked with saving this fashion magazine with their Gen Z approach. Gen Z loves sneakers and wind turbines. Fashion. In this movie, the girls notice that Hamilton, hashtag hot ham, is blowing up with his new Instagram filled to the brim with thirst traps. Only he's not Hamilton anymore. Is that Hamilton? You mean Jared Danger? How do you know him? We also learn from FaceTimes that Ezra's dad is divorcing the abusive stepmom, but that means he has to move back to London. Okay, so then how did they write off Tim Sharp? Oh, they don't? I mean, two out of three isn't bad, I suppose. But anyways, I don't have a ton to say about Intern in Chief or the movies really, but I can't not include them because again, the writers love to sneak critical lore into them. They're like the writers of the Marvel universe, tricking you into watching Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. because it will eventually connect to a Captain America movie. But is it worth it? Is it really worth it? So where is Adway? I realize this is a question that probably none of you have had, but it's a question that's kept me up for weeks. So we have to talk about it. Anytime a character refers to Attaway, it is just Attaway, not Attaway, Ohio, Attaway, New York, and fine, maybe that makes sense. Except when it absolutely does not make sense. There are several scenes where a Chicken Girls character will be in LA or at a college that's far from their hometown, somewhere, and someone will ask where they're from, and they'll just be like, Attaway, and people will be like, hmm, that sounds like a small town. Where are you two from? Attaway. What? Away? Out away. Sounds like the middle of nowhere. Oh, here's my card. And no one ever has any follow-up questions like, out away what? Out away where? What state? What region? You, you might as well be telling them that you're from Main Street, like you're giving them absolutely no information. But despite Attaway supposedly being in the middle of nowhere, there's a company from San Francisco, Silicon Valley, who moves in with plans to make Attaway their central business hub. There's also a major fashion magazine, Trey Chic, operated directly in Attaway. In season two, they fly to Los Angeles and the characters seem very excited to fly to this exotic land, LA, but there are fully palm trees in the background. They also clearly film at a high school outside of LA and I don't know if this is a surprise to people who live in Southern California, but most other states don't have like outdoor walkways or outdoor lockers because most places don't have a constant sunny temperate environment for that to make any practical sense. When Rhyme is applying for colleges, she's choosing between two of the main universities people in the Chicken Girls universe apply to, Provincetown and State. What state? It's just state. Maybe best of all, when Rhyme is in her bad girl era and she gets a fake ID by the girl who did like the clown makeup stuff in the pandemic, her fake ID address is 313 Sunnyvale Street, Attaway. Answer the question, you cowards. I demand the truth from these chicken girl writers. What state is Attaway in? <laughs> I forgot to number this one. The book. Yeah, that's right. I read. Specifically, I read Rhyme and the Runaway Twins. My favorite book. First of all, I need to address a serious crime that I unknowingly participated in. I ordered this book used off of Amazon.com. My, my first mistake, you could say. And when it arrived, I noticed it had this sticker on the spine and I was like, that kind of looks like a library sticker. And then I turned it around and saw, yep, this book fully belongs to the Lancaster Public Library. It appears that someone 
stole a book from the great people of the Lancaster Public Library and resold it to me and didn't even bother taking off the stickers to cover up their crime. I mean, I guess there's nothing you can do about like the stamp across the top, so maybe they just thought, why bother? So to librarians everywhere, I apologize for my participation in this scheme. We love librarians here on this channel. I did donate the cost of buying this book new to the Lancaster Public Library System, so hopefully my sin can be forgiven. Back to the book. This was the first in a series as shown here, but it appears that we're getting the rest of this series around the same time George R.R. Martin released the last Game of Thrones book. The first thing I noticed, you know, after realizing that I had stolen a library book, was that the cover looked very reminiscent of like the old Nancy Drew books I used to read as a kid. And I also noticed that they did rhyme so dirty. Someone lied to her several times. And it turns out this 1960s Nancy Drew packaging was intentional because for one, these are mystery books. And because these books apparently canonically exist within the 1960s in the Brat universe. I realize we've been talking about the Chicken Girls, which takes place entirely in modern day, and we'll get to this later, so don't think about it too much just yet. But Brat does have another show called A Girl Named Joe, which takes place in the 1960s and has Jules LeBlanc, the girl who plays Rhyme, play the character Joe Chambers. In the promotion for this book, they have Joe Chambers reading this mystery book, and she's like, oh, I just love to read this book when I'm not doing my 1960s. Th That's not how she sounds. But she's like, oh my gosh, I love, I love reading this book. But the story in the book is about Rhyme, a character who exists in modern day. This takes place in the summer between the Chicken Girls movie and Chicken Girls season three. So 2018, Joe Chambers was reading this book in the 1960s about the town that she lives in 60 years in the future. And she seems to have had no existential crisis about that fact. But I digress. We don't know who actually wrote this book, but Matilda Higgins is the credited author. Matilda Higgins is the former editor-in-chief of the Outaway Appeal and an aspiring novelist and historian. She helps Miss Sharp, that's Kayla's mom, the Attaway librarian, create an incredible historical exhibit for the county fair. Her behind-the-scenes access to the story of Rhyme and the Mysterious Twins, since she actually took part in the adventure, of course, makes her the authority on writing about Rhyme's unbelievable summer. As you heard, this character Matilda writes about how Rhyme meets these two 16-year-olds, Meg and Conrad. Rhyme says Conrad looked exactly like Meg. They weren't just brother and sister, they were twins. I mean, I don't mean to burst Rhyme's bubble here, but fraternal twins develop from two different eggs and two different sperms. So really, they are just like brother and sister. I mean, isn't it just the worst when someone tells you that they're a twin and it turns out that they're a fake twin, they're a fraternal twin? I remember when my Nana told me that she was a twin and I found out her twin was just like some dude. And I was like, why would you waste my time like this, Nana? But also my Nana watches this channel sometimes and I love you so much and that was a joke. Anyways, Rhyme meets these twins, the Runaway Twins. They're from Asheville, North Carolina, which is supposedly very far away, wherever that may be. They've come to Attaway because their grandma, who raised them, passed away recently. And it turns out that their grandma may have had a secret lover back in the day when she lived in Attaway. They think the secret boyfriend is their actual biological grandfather. They know this guy at least exists because about five years ago, their grandma got a letter from this guy named Vinny saying like, oh my gosh. I love you so much, blah, 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 blah. But when their grandma passed away, their uncle, who they've never met before, showed up and is trying to take the money from grandma's estate and send the twins to foster care. Hence why they've run away, the runaway twins. So Rhyme and the twins have to find this biological grandfather to make a claim on the estate and save the twins before the uncle finds them. While this is happening, Rhyme is working at the library with Matilda, the author of this book, because as we've established, she failed the test test back in the Chicken Girls movie. You say, I only hear what I want to. And she needs to study at the library all summer. They use these archives to find out that there's a person named Vincent Patterson, who they believe to be the biological grandfather of the twins. Turns out he was a young black man living in Millwood, the neighboring town in the 1960s. Their grandma B was a white woman. And because they lived in a racist place and B had racist parents, when B got pregnant, B got sent to a sanatorium and Vincent was forbidden from seeing her because he was a black man. Vinny, Vincent, ships off to Vietnam and when B gets out of the sanatorium, she moves on, marries someone else and has another child who is the evil uncle who is now pursuing the runaway twins. But 
Plot twist, Rhyme is going through the records and she sees Vincent Patterson died in the Vietnam War. So who was writing letters to their grandma? They also find this stock certificate, I don't know, money isn't real, for a company which they don't really know why, but they have a feeling the stock certificate is what the uncle is really after, and that it's somehow this very valuable stock certificate. Again, money isn't real, this guy's evil. They all end up at the county fair and this old black man gets up on the stage and is like, hey, my name is Silas Manderley, but some of you may know me as Vincent Patterson. He then tells the story of how Silas was his friend in Vietnam, Silas was killed, Vincent ended up with Silas's dog tags around his neck, so people assumed that he was Silas and that Vincent was the one who died. Then Vincent gets back to America and he's like, well, since B is gone and everyone thinks I'm dead, I'm going to take my dead friend's name Silas and start a company and name it after my dead friend Silas. He then explains that because he was a light-skinned black man, having the name Silas Manderley made him pass more as a white person than the name Vincent Patterson did, and that's why he never corrected like the name mix-up. He ends this speech by saying that if anyone who thinks they're my grandkid wants to come and talk to me, like, what's up? I'll, I'll be standing over here. But the evil uncle is holding one of the twins at knife point and demanding that Rhyme give him the stock certificate that is apparently worth millions of dollars. This hostage situation is all happening on a Ferris wheel, by the way. Rhyme is in one car and Evil Uncle is down below. So she gives the certificate to Evil Uncle. Evil Uncle jumps out of the Ferris wheel and is chased by security, but they never find him. This Evil Uncle just gets away with millions of dollars after attempting to murder children? That's actually how the book ends. But the twins meet their biological grandfather and he's super rich. So hey, who cares? Let, let bygones be bygones, I guess. I have to assume that the uncle escaping was some sort of setup for uh, the sequel that we never got, but we may, we may never know. Honestly, this was a pretty serviceable tween mystery book. I'm kind of sad they didn't do more of these. I also cut out all the parts where Rhyme is like, why won't TK text me back? Cause that takes up like 30 pages. Every chapter she'll, she'll think back to, hmm, TK hasn't texted me back, huh? But what's most important about this book is that it significantly narrows down the question I posed to you earlier about where exactly Attaway is. The twins are from North Carolina and for some reason have a Virginia driver's license that is actually never explained in the book. Both of these states are considered far away, but the twins were also still able to drive to Attaway. We also learn in the county fair that Attaway was one of the towns on the outside perimeter of the Dust Bowl that impacted the Midwest in the 1930s. And this narrows the search down quite significantly. We know that this does not take place in Texas because a character moves to Texas later in the show, so that's a big chunk of the map crossed off. So that leaves Kansas, Nebraska, New Mexico, Oklahoma, and Colorado. So close, yet so far from the truth. Wow, I really stopped numbering these in my notes, didn't I? The continuity, or lack thereof. There are many moments throughout this series that just make my head spin and I have to let it go, but not before I complain about it to you. You definitely get the feeling that the writers don't watch their episodes again or really plan for the episode immediately after the one that they're writing. I mean, one of the biggest examples that I really didn't get to earlier in the video is how dance is everything to these girls for the first two seasons. It's like the whole plot, but by season three, Ellie is the only character on the dance team and she also quits by season four. And you'll remember that Ellie was the first to quit in season one. So the fact that she ends up being the most committed to dance team by the end also doesn't really make sense. And that's not necessarily a continuity error, but when there's little to no in-universe explanation for why all these characters just stopped caring about dance, it's just bad character development. Another example in season three, TK moves away to Texas because his parents are divorcing. He's chosen to move away with his dad to Texas, even though his sister Birdie is staying in Attaway and he just got together with Rhyme, the love of his life. And his dream is to go to Hollywood and make movies. His friend in Attaway is the son of a famous movie director. So very much unclear why he's deciding to go to Texas anyways. The real answer is probably because his parents wanted him off the show, understandably. Also the 12 year olds playing Rhyme and TK who had been dating before and again had that weird shipping culture around them. They'd broken up by this point, so yeah. TK leaves, and at the end of season three, Birdie is in a coma. Rhyme rushes to the hospital when gasp. TK? Oh, 
But cut to season four, TK is back in Texas, totally off screen the whole season, and is ignoring Ryan writing him letters. We never find out if they spoke at the hospital. They don't show that hospital scene again other than TK just standing there. What was the point of having TK stand in that hallway? I don't know, other than the writers thought it would look dramatic for that one episode and forget about it. Forget it happened. One of the more egregious examples of this weird setup issue they seem to have is there's this girl stalking the dance team in one of the later seasons. The girls learn that this is actually the dance coach's sister and he's like, you know what? Why not have this stalker be our assistant coach? My sister Penelope really needs me right now, but she is a really good dancer and I could use the help during practice. How would you girls feel if she became assistant coach? As co-captain, I think I can speak for the team. And it's a resounding yes. But then the very next episode, he says this. I was wondering if you'd like to take over the role as co-captain in her absence. Me? Yes, you. I could really use the extra help now that Penelope's gone. And then that coach disappears without explanation the next season. I mean, we hadn't had a dance coach for any of the seasons prior to that or any of the seasons following that, so I guess we shouldn't be that surprised. Also, the later seasons make dance important again, yeah. But there are other times where the writers will just outright contradict themselves. In season two, the chicken girls can't qualify for regionals because they only have five team members and they need six. We got better things to do than wait around here all day. Then get lost. Your team isn't qualified to participate anyway. What? Only teams of six or more can compete in the state championships. But at the beginning of the show, there were only five spots on the dance team, or were there seven? I'm not quite sure. And then there are plenty of other times where there are five girls on the dance team, and that's not a problem. This six-person requirement is never mentioned again. <laughs> How many spots are there on the dance team, and where is that away? Why won't they answer the real questions? I mean, the biggest continuity wormhole is just ages of all of these characters. In season one, the four original chicken girls try out for the Attaway dance team. I assumed, and I think most people assumed, that they were trying out for their high school dance team because supposedly they go to dance camp, they've been super into dance for years, they probably would have been on their middle school dance team. And now that they're in high school, a new school, they need to try out for the dance team at their high school. Them being freshmen in season one also makes sense because Birdie and Rooney are the older siblings of TK and Quinn and they are the dance captains. Rooney is Quinn's stepsister, so maybe they could still be in the same grade, but Birdie is explicitly TK's biological older sister, implying she must be at least a grade above TK, who is the same age as Rhyme. Now, even in the first season, it is still a little confusing how old these characters are, because, of course, Power Surge, the other Attaway school, clearly has a nine-year-old on their team. You guys signing up for state two? Did she really just ask me that? She really just asked you that. So maybe they aren't supposed to be in middle school. When they host later auditions for the dance team, full-on adults try out for the dance team, as well as tiny children. So maybe Attaway has the middle school and high school connected. They have two dance teams, Power Surge and Attaway dance team, and instead of doing something that makes sense, like having a middle school team and high school team, they're both mixed high school and middle school students. But that can't be true because in season three, Rhyme, Quinn, Ellie, and Kayla start high school and they have to once again try out for the dance team, which is run by an entirely different group of girls whom we have never seen before. And in season four, there's a couple episodes where they're all wearing like the grade that they're in on their t-shirts. Rooney and Birdie are juniors, whereas the main chicken girls are freshmen. So then why were Rooney and Birdie on the same dance team with the original girls when the OG girls would have been in eighth grade at the time. When TK goes to what should be their eighth grade dance, Baby Ariel is there because of course she is. Baby Ariel is like, oh, TK, I'm I'm too old for you. May I have this dance? Look, Drew, I think it's more of a friendship thing. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> TK, you're so sweet. Did I just embarrass myself? TK, you're like way younger than me. I feel really stupid right about now. Don't sweat it. 
Which, yes, she is, but also you're the one at a middle school dance, so maybe get off your high horse, baby Ariel. Also, when Rhyme is supposed to be in eighth grade, she has four different love interests with wild variety in ages. Are these people all supposed to be the same age as Rhyme? Do we need to call the cops? And this non-commitment to the, the ages of these characters doesn't even get better <laughs> in later seasons. In a later season, we have a character, Layla, who again is canonically an eighth grader, but she has a romance plotline with someone who is clearly 22 years old. Maybe they're supposed to be a high schooler. I mean, I guess. But then they have a scene where these two characters are talking about how hard eighth grade is. And that one's especially unfortunate because that character is non-binary and I appreciate the representation. I appreciate having queer relationship storylines, but the whole time they're on screen, I'm just like, stay away from this child. No, <laughs> back away. There just should not be a love triangle between these three people, no matter their gender identity. <laughs> so how old are they? I mean, honestly, it makes my head hurt. I feel like in the beginning, they did want the girls to be starting high school, but then maybe they noticed that Jules LeBlanc simply did not pass for a high schooler because she was a 12 year old when they started the show. So they retconned it later or they just like straight up forgot all the stuff and never rewatched everything, like I said, and didn't think anyone would notice. I mean, the real answer to all of these questions is this is a show for kids and the writers don't trust the children to notice or care. But guess what? I noticed. So who's the idiot now? The lore. There is an extended lore to the Chicken Girls that covers over 100 years. And you cannot have a complete Chicken Girls experience until you know this extended history. So I present to you the history board. A fun fact, some of you may remember I used to have a different board which I used in my videos most recently for the Bad Cinderella video. Well, uh, I left my board propped up against the wall after filming and the Bad Cinderella sets were, were still on it. I went to work and when I came home I saw that Goose had peed on it. He peed on the Bad Cinderella sets. So that's, that's Goose's Bad Cinderella review. Anyways, new board! new pictures. Aren't we all so excited? This board, unfortunately, is, is much smaller than the last one, and I did run out of thumbtacks, so I had to use, like, actual nails to put up some of these pictures. So I'll be honest, it's, it's looking a little, a little chaotic. You know, everyone has their strengths, and I've come to learn that making a conspiracy board is not my strength, and that's, you know, that's the cross I have to bear. And maybe I should stop insisting on including conspiracy boards in my, my videos, but I don't know. I don't know. I just, you know, I just, I just thought it'd be fun. Anyways, y'all want to know the lore? Right, last time I did one of these conspiracy board videos, I used a wand from an undisclosed magical franchise. This time, we are using a metal straw that I, you know, had lying around. Upgrades, people, upgrades. There are three families central to the Attaway lore. Now, interestingly, this does not include the Attaway family. There is an Attaway family who the town was named after, but they don't make it on this board. They're not really relevant. Imagine not making the top three of most iconic families in a town that you founded. No, the central families in this case are the Fitzroys, the Duponts, and the Atkins. Back in the early 20th century, Freddie Fitzroy wanted to make Attaway the automobile capital of the United States. He was coming for Henry Ford's brands, labor rights violations and all. Celia Atkins, one of the workers at this factory, convinced Freddie that actually it would be much more cost efficient to specialize in rubber and become a rubber factory. That way they can sort of cut down on production costs and sell tires to people like Henry Ford. And Freddie is resistant to this idea because, you know, it wasn't his and he's a businessman on that grind set, but eventually he folds. The factory becomes a rubber factory. He concedes to some of Celia's demands for workers' rights and, of course, takes all the credit and profit for the rubber factory. Flash forward to the 1950s and Frances Atkins, who is actually depicted on the show multiple times. I just kind of for I forgot to print her out and she is important to the story. So, you know, enjoy this. This little visual, that's what she looks like, sure. Frances Atkins is working at the rubber factory. She's working there when it mysteriously bursts into flames. It burns down, she dies in there, and another mysterious woman dies in there. Frances's surviving family is her brother, Bobby Atkins, and her husband, Thomas Chambers. And then they also have their two kids, Junior and Joe Chambers, who you may notice that Joe 
looks like a certain someone, and Celia also looks like a certain someone. There is an in-universe explanation for that, but just you wait. When Joe Chambers is in middle school in the 1960s, she becomes friends with Kathy Fitzroy. So the Fitzroys are still living well off that inherited wealth. We love to see it. Kathy and Joe become besties. And the two of them, along with this guy, Alan, are basically trying to figure out what happened the night that Frances died, because famously, she died. And during all this time, the DuPont family, including Lawrence DuPont, who can be seen right here, they're working on building the DuPont Hotel with the Fitzroys in collaboration with the Fitzroys. Oops, sorry, Mr. Fitzroy. Let me sit you back. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. He's, he's fine. He's fine. The the DuPonts and the Fitzroys are working on the DuPont Hotel, which is going to become the new central piece of the Attaway economy to replace the rubber factory because you know, ah, she died. Uh, factory's gone. Whoops. Happens to the best of us. And as I said, the DuPonts have this kid, Lawrence, and he's just a real dick. You know, he's a real dick to Joe and Kathy and just a, a real thorn in their sides. But it honestly doesn't really matter because Kathy's brother, Henry, is sort of mess. He's messing with Lawrence. He's messing with his dad. He's messing with the DuPont's dad. He's scheming and he wants to be part of the family business. He wants in on this hotel thing. But it turns out that Henry and his evil girlfriend who is pregnant at the time with their child, Randy, they're scheming to take the DuPont money for the hotel and they end up running off with a bunch of money that was supposed to go to the hotel and they form the Roach Gang. And this starts a whole other branch of the family tree, which I honestly did not print out most of them because I did not feel like it. But this becomes the Roach game. He becomes Jimmy Roach. She becomes something something Roach. This is their daughter, Randy Roach, who is briefly raised as a Chambers child because there's a time where evil lady is dating Joe's dad and they try and trick the, the dad into thinking that Randy Roach is his kid, but it's not. And so they end up taking him back. It's, it's a whole thing. The Roach gang is here. They're doing mafia business. And this continues well into today. And one of the people I forgot to include on the Roach gang family tree is Roberta Roach, otherwise known as Robin Robbins, the evil music producer who bullied Ellie in season two. Do you think I'd be where I am if I hadn't changed my name to Robin Robbins? Your name's not Robin Robbins, Roberta Roach. Oh, it doesn't play. But her son, Robbie Robbins, is also a Roach member. And as you remember, he briefly has a run-in with the gang, becomes a member, but that really only lasts a couple of episodes because they can't, they can't commit to these things. But spinning back up to the 1960s, Kathy ends up marrying Alan and they form Alan's Arcade, which becomes a central location in the early seasons of the Chicken Girls and is for some reason called Royce's Arcade. Hmm. But who cares because after Robin Robbins buys the arcade in season two, it is never mentioned again. And Kathy and Alan are the grandparents of the nine-year-old on Power Surge and the cousin of Claire Fitzroy, who is a character who will be introduced in the later seasons. Somehow, someway, Junior Chambers, at one point he becomes entangled with the Roach Gang in like the 80s or the 90s. So much so that members of the Roach Gang end up going and killing his wife, the mother of Nellie Chambers, at his coffee shop. And uh, this crime is, is never solved or never really dealt with again. But because Junior has this young daughter, Nellie, there and the Roach Gang are like, mm, sorry, I'm sorry, we killed, we killed your wife. They end up paying for Nellie to go to Crown Lake, which is the fancy private school, as sort of a consolation prize for, you know, the whole mob murder thing. Junior's isn't a central character necessarily, but the coffee shop that he runs, Junior's Coffee Shop, does become a central location. It essentially replaces the set of Alan's Arcade for the remainder of the show. But in modern day, Junior is sober, he's chillaxing, and his daughter Nellie has kind of gone off the deep end after she uh, attempted to burn some people in high school but you know we'll <laughs> we'll get around to that when we get around to that but anyways in modern day claire fitzroy is visiting junior's coffee shop and talking about how great her ancestor freddie fitzroy is for you know making the town so prosperous way back in the day and junior's is like that's not true ellen that's not true it's actually my ancestor who did all that cool stuff freddie fitzroy was a nitwit with a big bank account and he nearly destroyed this town And to Claire's credit, she's like, yeah, actually, fuck my ancestor, pro-workers' rights. Let's get the truth out there. My ancestor sucked. And when Junior is telling the story, he's going through like old albums and he's like, wait a minute, why does my sister look exactly like this girl who's been coming into my coffee shop for the past, you know, 10 years? How did I not just notice that they're, they're the exact same person? She looks an awful lot like... Yeah. 
she does. We then learn that Bobby Atkins, yeah, remember him, he was besties with Rhyme and Harmony's grandparents. So much so that when Rhyme and Harmony's grandparents couldn't have children, Bobby donated his sperm to make Rhyme and Harmony's mom and aunt. So the reason Rhyme looks like Joe, looks like Celia, is because they're all distantly related. There's no real explanation for why TK looks like Freddie Fitzroy. I guess that's just kind of a, a fun thing. Who doesn't want to see Hayden Summerall in a little mustache? I mean, doesn't they look so fun and kooky? And I bet you thought we had forgotten all about why Dixie D'Amelio is here. Well, Lawrence DuPont, he grows up and one day he takes his grandson to Attaway General because his grandson has eaten a marble and needs to poop it out. Once the grandson poops out that marble, he's like, oh no, I'm having a heart attack. And Dixie D'Amelio is like, oh, you sweet old man, you, let me, let me give you a kiss. There's, I'm making it sound like there's a romance plot. They just like hang out, but uh, Lawrence Dupont dies and Dixie D'Amelio is sad. So sad that she does not return for season two, I guess. Also, vampires canonically exist in this lore, but I couldn't really think of a way to incorporate that into this board. And like I said, I've left quite a number of characters out of this family tree. This is not all of the family connections that Brat TV has slowly woven into its universe. And I'm honestly not sure when they decided to start making all of these connections, but it is a smart move to sort of arbitrarily connect every single character to one another and build up this expanded lore. Because we've seen how well like recaps of Pretty Little Liars or Once Upon a Time do. Like people love these like mysterious plot twist family connections. I don't know what it is, especially when you see it all up on a fun little board like this. Are Tarzan and Elsa related? I don't know, but I need to know. And so of course I had to appreciate their effort into making all of these arbitrary family connections that don't necessarily add to the story, but aren't they fun? And don't they look so fun up here like this? This took me a long time, so this is worth it. This was worth it. The multiverse. So now that you've gotten a taste of the lore, let's talk about it. Let's talk about the Chicken Girls Expanded Universe. Chicken Girls is not the only show that Brat TV makes, and to be quite honest with you, I could not make myself watch watch all of them. I had to stop myself at a certain point. This video has a deadline. But I did try and watch at least all of the most popular ones, and I have some thoughts on them. So let's take a break from these poultry people and explore what else Brat TV has to offer. Like Manny. 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 How do I even summarize Manny? Like all brat shows, the show starts with a simple premise. There's a male nanny named Manny. And Manny has some kind of energy. Everyone on this show has some kind of energy, you could say. But true to Brat TV form, they abandon this premise very quickly and have Manny accidentally kill the teacher. You're next, scaredy cat. Who's a scaredy cat now? Mrs. Wright? Weekend at Bernie's, the teacher. Mrs. Wright? <laughs> is wearing sunglasses uh, because, um... Her eyes, right? Her eyes got the flu. Become a substitute teacher. And then by season four, he's just like a guy who hangs out with a bunch of kids, not in a, a nanny way. He's just there. Now, this show has a much younger cast than a lot of the other Brat TV shows. And I think it is supposed to be aimed at a much younger audience, which is perhaps why it's it's so chaotic to like keep five-year-olds attention but there are some jokes in there that really throw me for a loop we could finish reading huckleberry finn next and yeah maybe they're just like jokes written in there for like the adults watching with their kids or for like the cynical youtubers like myself who are watching it but i don't know i don't know as a parent how i would feel if like my five-year-old was watching this show broken bad looking at Can is that looking at where's my money mr crab looking at there's just like such an indescribable blend of some genuinely funny lines utter chaos and horrific cringe and my body can't even register which is which at certain times spongebob helped me through puberty me too <laughs> and he helped me cope with the passing of my parents hey no no running in the halls okay hey, shut your Hey, speaking of rhymes, can I call you Man Man? I heard Kendrick Lamar say it in his song, Humble, and I thought to myself, I need to know a Man Man. <laughs> Anywho. He got bad, bro. You know it used to be mellow. So take a look what you've done. 
And baby, now we got bad blood. Hey! And the plot does not help with that. Let me just tell you some things that happen in the show. There's one episode where the bus of school children is hijacked by a meth addict. Quality children's content. Oh, it's a credit card. Does they don't carry cash anymore? Crazy, huh? Yeah. There's one episode where Harmony and Manny are attacked by a venomous snake, die, and are revived by magical cave children, and also, for some reason, the snake venom makes diamonds come out of their wounds? There is an entire story arc where the kids enter a rap contest for a Japanese soda company run by a sad Australian man. They are kidnapped by this evil Japanese soda company. They escape the evil Japanese soda company. Manny goes to Tokyo, believe it or not, this was all shot on green screen, flies the sad Australian man back, and turns out this sad Australian man is the grandfather of the girl Manny Nannies. Yay! Family, family. He did kidnap and attempt to murder several children. I was only gonna watch one season of Manny, but it was kind of like a car crash. I, I couldn't look away. Be gone, bad juju! Be gone, hideous eyeliners. Be gone, Hot Topic sales selection. Good vibes. Good vibes. I mean, I watched four seasons before I even noticed that Dan left me. Total Eclipse. Total Eclipse is one of the more popular Brat TV shows, probably because it stars Kenzie Ziegler. This show takes place in Millwood, the town right next to Attaway, and Kenzie Ziegler really likes thinking about space and everyone hates her for it. I'll be honest, this is one of the shows I watched the least of. I could not get into it, but I did see this clip from season three and I don't want any context for it. None of you dare provide me context. I just know already that this is the peak of the show and I couldn't fool myself into thinking that it would be any better than this moment. You stole my song. Your song? I've been working on it for weeks. All you did is come up with a melody. The melody is the entire song. I did most of the work and you don't want me hanging with your family anyway, okay? Just best to part ways. I have more pressing issues with my family than you. So why watch the rest of the show when that scene was enough, you know? A Girl Named Joe. A Girl Named Joe takes place in the 1960s, and let me tell you, it took me two whole seasons of the show somehow to even notice that Jules LeBlanc had blue contacts in this whole time. This poor girl was committed to the character transformation and I, I didn't even notice. I pretty much explained the plot of A Girl Named Joe in our conspiracy board portion, but it's about Joe Chambers, A Girl Named Joe, and Claire Fitzroy solving the mystery of the town fire, uncovering all their family drama, and talking about milkshakes a lot because this is a period piece. Maybe this is a sign of a very low bar, but I didn't even try to examine the historical accuracy of the costumes, the sets, the dialogue. I mean, the car in the background of the first episode is probably not the best sign, but honestly, I think this was one of my favorite Brat TV shows. The whole thing kind of reminds me of the first season of Riverdale where there's a central mystery, each episode you learn more about that mystery, and then there's also some fun teen drama thrown in there. And actually the first season of A Girl Named Joe has almost the exact same ending as Riverdale season one, which is a spoiler for both this show and Riverdale. Deal with it. This is again probably another indicator of my very low expectations, but I was genuinely surprised at how they address the civil rights movement and the race anxiety of the 1960s. I was fully prepared for this to just be a show about white people having fun in the 60s or like some colorblind version where they just like don't have to address it. But in season two, they introduced two new black characters, Dwight and Abby, who are participating in the busing program, the integration program from Millwood to Attaway. Joe and Kathy become friends with these two characters and they're kicked out of a diner because the owner refuses to serve to black people and they all form a protest. In season three, Joe and Abby are working at the World's Fair in New York City and Abby is not allowed to work in the air conditioning. She can only work outside. So there's a whole storyline where Abby joins an advocacy group and grapples with not wanting to rock the boat or risk losing her job, but wanting better, of course, for herself and for other black people. White and Kathy also end up dating in the third season and you watch Watch them navigate the real difficulties of being in an interracial relationship in the 1960s. It's very toned down. This is like still a kid's show, so they don't show like the brutality or the slurs that were directed at people. But I was genuinely surprised that the show wasn't just like, oh, Martin Luther King gave a speech, Civil Rights Act passed and everything was fine. No, there was a 
huge time of social upheaval even after laws and popular ideas began to change. I don't want to say it was flawless representation. I mean, even if I knew the minutia of the 1960s history, it's obviously not my history. So it'd be goofy for me to be like, yep, nailed it. No notes. You heard it here first from this white lady. And it is still generally a, a side plot in a show about two white girls in the 1960s. But it did at least feel like these issues were shown with some level of care and nuance. And hey, if Brat TV is only going to put 10% of their energy into these shows, I'm glad they at least recognize that this was one of the things they like shouldn't vote it in on. Crown Lake. Crown Lake is Brat TV's Gossip Girl, and they are very explicit about that in the marketing for the show. This is another one of the higher quality Brat TV shows. I think the sets, the costumes are all super strong, and the acting in at least the first two seasons are actually much better than a lot of the other Brat TV shows out there. To be honest, I feel like they just didn't hire as many social media stars. I know the lead actor who plays Nellie Chambers was on Disney Channel's Dog with a Blog. Does that count as stunt casting? I mean, I don't know. But this show takes place in the 90s at the fancy Crown Lake boarding school. And because this is a Gossip Girl knockoff, they do, of course, have a mysterious and sassy narrator. This is a story about four girls. Nellie, Tiffany, Chloe, and Lucy. They didn't all make it out of Crown Lake. No one who crosses me ever does. The protagonist, Nellie Chambers, the daughter of Junior Chambers, is of course attending the school because the mob is paying for her tuition, which the other students have a pretty nonchalant reaction to. The mob. <laughs> How pathetic. When Nellie moves into her dorm, she finds a journal from a girl named Heather. Now, this is basically like the plot of the Half-Blood Prince, where this journal has all these tips on how to be cool. But it turns out that we were all Heather. Heather was the friends we made along the way. What's going on? Where are you leading me? You did it, Nellie. Is everyone Heather? <laughs> We all contributed. Basically, at Crown Lake, they all haze the new girls by giving them instructions on how to be cool. Yeah, that'll get them. <laughs> but for Nellie, she never stops getting Heather messages, even though supposedly the Heather hazing should be done. So when the new girl, Lucy, finds out that Nellie was being the fake Heather for Lucy because Lucy was the new girl and now they have to haze Lucy by being Heather, Nellie is still getting all these Heather messages from someone else. The second season ends with us once again learning that Heather was the friends we made along the way. Finally figure it out. Someone had to stop you from destroying everything. My battery died, so don't mind the slight change in angle if there is any. All right, except then season three flashes forward 25 years with just the wildest exposition showing what happened off screen between these two seasons. Need help with your bags? I'm good on my own, but thanks. Yeah, turns out Nellie went crazy and burned down a building with Lucy in it. And we just didn't get to see that. Also, season three fully brings back the influencer actors. You can't seriously want to room with Morgan McQuaid over me. She thinks she's in the Matrix. Listen, if this is about I just wanted to branch out, okay? I almost forgot this was a Brat TV show. At least season three gave us this line. It's cool that you're gay. Attaway General. Attaway General is maybe their most infamous show to date. You know, the Grey's Anatomy knockoff that came out during the peak of the pandemic. You know, the perfect time to watch influencer teens in the healthcare industry. I don't want to talk too much about this one because I feel like the show got like covered to death a couple of years ago, but I'll just say this. Imagine you're in a car accident. You rush to the hospital. You're bleeding out and there are just a bunch of TikTokers in your hospital room while you recover. You went too fast. You didn't. Run. Follow. No, more energy. <laughs> Chicken Girls, The College Years. This show is a direct spinoff, unlike the others I've just talked about. Birdie and Rooney, the two oldest girls, are in college now, and you definitely get the sense that this show was aimed at a older audience. I don't really have a ton of 
funny things to say about it because I think it's pretty good by Brat TV standards and I honestly think they would have been better off just having this be Chicken Girl season 10 instead of what we got. More on that later. It has a lot of the typical Chicken Girls plot lines with boy drama and cliques, but now it's like sororities and fraternities. But you know, I think it also has some good representation. It has a trans character who for the most part is just like part of the girl group living her life, but she also does have a plot line dedicated to her transition and her relationship with her family. There's also a plot line about consent, which is, you know, watered down to be appropriate for like a tween audience, but I think it's is generally well done. In season two, Rooney and Birdie kiss, which has been like a huge fanship since the beginning of Chicken Girls. I haven't really mentioned this before, but Rooney has been like the bisexual icon of the Chicken Girls franchise, and they fully embrace that in Chicken Girls the college years. The characters of Rooney and Birdie, since they've been on Chicken Girls for the past seven seasons, their characters are fleshed out. The actors are already comfortable in front of a camera. Grading on the Brat TV curve, this show's pretty good, which Again, makes what happens on the actual Chicken Girls even sadder. So let's get to it. The Harmony problem. Harmony is Rhyme's little sister. When Harmony and Rhyme go to LA in season two, Harmony gets approached by an agent on the beach who wants her to star in a multicam sitcom and she goes. Off screen from Harmony's appearances on the Chicken Girls and Manny, Harmony becomes a celebrity and the star of a hit TV show Hotel de Lune. I mean, can you even imagine what that sitcom must be like? Oh wait, we don't have to imagine. Rat TV made Hotel de Lune. I see, we're gonna be like enemies who secretly kind of like each other. More like Elsa and the townspeople before she turns the village to spring. <laughs> what, I'm super into Frozen. Listen, when Brat TV commits to the canon, they go all in. And so when Harmony is on the Chicken Girls, they basically have her act like a tiny Mariah Carey. Everyone knows a new beginning starts with a good sage map. Not anyone I know. It's a Hollywood thing. Angelinos invented the art of reinvention. This book claims the vibes. Or at least that's what my shaman says. Here's some samples they sent me. Face mask, nail polish, and lotion. Go to town, ladies. I'm about to get a snail facial. Okay, Rhyme, this is where you come in. I know you're not exactly a style icon, but there's something non-threatening about your look. Thank you. She's a celebrity. She's a schemer, a little agent of chaos. Whoa, he's into like whales or women. Spicy. Yeah, but it turns out it's just his grandma, the well, a singer. Fantastic. I can work with that. Hey, Rhyme, I'm so glad you called. I called? She sure did. How did you get my letters back? <gasps> Thomas K. You went through our trash and found Rhyme's letters? Unbelievable. Why do you always have to meddle? And then, all of a sudden, in season seven of The Chicken Girls, she just becomes Rhyme. Now you're in high school and you've been in a school play and you were the editor-in-chief on the paper and now you're back in LA and you're at cheer camp. You know, you've never been afraid to start something new. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> no, seriously. You make me want to be brave too. So by season seven, the original Chicken Girls are growing up. Although Kayla was already written off in season four, by this point, the other cast members were clearly ready to move on to bigger and better things. And so in season seven, they introduce a ton of new middle schoolers. A few of them are like Harmony, where they were side characters on Manny or the Chicken Girls before, but a lot of them are entirely new actors and entirely new storylines focusing on them. But because Harmony is now the protagonist of the show, they basically have to undo all of the quirky, over-the-top parts of her personality they've been establishing for the past six seasons so that she can become a blank slate protagonist for everyone to relate to. And to that I say, Bleh! I would have loved watching a 12-year-old B-list celebrity interact with normal kids. Also, it just feels totally disingenuous to the character they establish. There's a storyline in season seven where Harmony gives a makeover to this girl, Claire, and sets her up with Addison Rae's little brother in the hopes that this girl, Brie, her boyfriend will get jealous and leave Brie for Claire. And Harmony is pretty straightforward about this being her motive, that her motive is revenge on Brie. Maybe if you go to the rally with me, Belle would get really jealous and move away. <laughs> That's a terrible idea. But maybe. Hey, do you know Claire Fitzroy? The really annoying girl? Mm. That's the one. I'm forming a plan. Do you want to date or not? All right, I guess I'm in. What do you even talk about on a date? 
it doesn't matter. The point is, is to make Eggie jealous. But afterwards, Claire and Addison Ray's little brother are both so mad at Harmony. I thought she was setting me up to be nice, but now I think she was just doing it for her own reasons. So she was scheming? Yeah, and it's really been bugging me because I thought we were friends. Everyone's like, Harmony, this isn't like you. Why would you lie like this? My experience with Harmony, she's always been a straight shooter like her sister. I have to say, I'm really surprised at you. This isn't the Harmony I know. How did you get my letters back? <gasps> Thomas K. You went through our trash and found Rhymes letters? Unbelievable. Why do you always have to meddle? Harmony would constantly be scheming, be meddling in Rhyme's love life, like all through seasons one through six. Even on Manny, she disguised herself as a boy so that she could win the rap contest hosted by the evil Japanese soda conglomerate. She's always been willing to meddle and scheme, and we've been eating that up for the past like five years. But now that she's the protagonist of a children's show, she suddenly has to be boring and have a moral compass. I mean, the show was written for children. Why did I watch all of this again? The new Chicken Girls. Season 7 is the transition period between the original Chicken Girls cast and the new Chicken Girls cast. Throughout the season, you'll see one of the OG Chicken Girls just randomly importing their wisdom to the 8th graders they run into while eating some delicious cinnamon toast crunch. The cinnamon dust only reveals so much. Cinnamon dust? Yeah, like when your cinnamon toast crunch and milk mix together, you stare really hard. You can see the future. Like they have Quinn be the student teacher for the theater club, even though out of the OG for Chicken Girls, Ryan was the only one who ever vaguely showed an interest in theater, and even then, that was only for a season. Harmony auditions for the play, and she's super nervous about it, even though, again, it was established that she's a world-famous actor, and in previous seasons, she'd intimidated the entire school out of auditioning for plays just by her announcing that she was going to audition for herself. How was your first day in middle school? I got the lead in the school play. They were holding auditions on the first day of school? That's crazy. Oh, sweetie, when they heard I wanted the role, no one tried out. And now all of a sudden she's like, I'm like so, I'm so nervous. I've never acted before. Yes, you have. You have acted before, Harmony. Also, I guess because this is a new set of Chicken Girls, the writers are suddenly like, oh yeah, this show was supposed to be about dancing. We haven't had dancing in this show for five seasons. Bree, one of our new Chicken Girls, is captain of the dance team. And I think she is so cute. They always style her with like butterflies and it gets more and more elaborate as the show goes on. Another one of our new chicken girls is Layla. Layla likes to hack into evil corporation computers and date girls. He gave you crimes. We love. The fourth chicken girl is Claire, played by Eliana Wesley. Now, despite the fact that Eliana was in real life part of Dance Moms and is by far one of the best dancers on the show, she is not on the dance team because that would make too much sense, I guess. Obviously, when shows change their cast significantly, fans aren't gonna like it. I saw quite a few comments of 10-year-olds saying, we want the old chicken girls back. Now the only people on these shows are TikTokers. You know, as if the show wasn't full of influencers before. And I get why they're sad, and I don't expect 10-year-olds to understand that these teenagers are becoming adults and probably don't want to be on a kid's YouTube channel forever. But in their defense, Brett also could have just canceled Chicken Girls and started fresh with another high school drama show. I mean, it's not like the phrase Chicken Girls was ever that inherent to the plot. They also, as I proposed earlier, could have made the show just about the college years with Rooney and Birdie, even though they weren't technically Chicken Girls. I mean, who cares? It's close enough, but the Chicken Girls name sells, so we can't do either of those things. Even though this was not welcomed by fans, I do think that Season 7 and Season 8 of the Chicken Girls with the new Chicken Girls cast are two of the stronger seasons of the show, even setting aside my issues with Harmony's character. I think the new kid actors they got for these seasons are very cute, very funny. Don't make me choose sides harm, because real talk, I'm unpredictable. Post for Katie. She's really good at Animal Crossing. Um, she always has an extra pencil on the con side. Uh, she hates country music. Her sister practices witchcraft, and she never likes any of my tweets. How could she not like your tweets? How about she's really cute? Dude, it's not cool to judge people by their looks. You're right, I'm sorry. I didn't even realize Addison Ray's little brother was Addison Ray's little brother until Addison Ray's mom showed up to play a soccer coach. Something about the way he speaks just reminds me of Charlie Brown. Like, he's just such a cute little kid. We haven't met yet, but I've heard great things about you, which is why I'm wondering if you'll accompany me to this year's trip rally. They introduced Simone, who was previously on Manny with Harmony, as Gus's girlfriend slash sister. And you must be Gus's day. 
Simone, I'm from Millwood, and we're definitely not here on a date. Well, not exactly a date, but... Not at all. My mom's dating Gus's dad, so they wanted us to hang. Wait, wait, wait. Your parents are dating? You're like siblings. She's the new chaotic villain of season seven because she dances for the Millwood dance team. And when I tell you I audibly gasped at the season seven finale... Haven't you heard? My mom and I are moving to Attaway. Oh, no, I didn't. But sorry, this is... I'm familiar with the chicken heads. Chicken heads? You heard her. Since you guys build on the dance team, we're starting our own. You can't do this. Sure we can. We're holding auditions for our new squad. Power Surge. Come on, girls. Also, of course, they immediately undo that in season eight. You'll see our regionals. Regionals? More like after school. What are you talking about? Haven't you heard? There's only one dance team this year. What? And it's gonna be us. See you at tryouts, poultry woman. So, so much for Power Surge coming back after five seasons. Wasn't that a fun little tease? Wouldn't that have been cool if that had actually happened? We had the characters Eggy and Bree, who are childhood best friends because their parents are best friends, who I'm just gonna say it, have some real swinger energy to them. Mark's the same way. Really? There they go again, giving us grief. Reminds me of junior year. <laughs> <laughs> if it weren't for college, we wouldn't have all met. And gotten married. And had you too. <laughs> Every year they eat casserole and talk about how much they want their two kids, Eggie and Bree, to date. I can only assume that the actors they cast to play Eggie and Bree's parents are the child actor's actual parents in real life because I refuse to believe that they held auditions and like hand selected these people. It smells kind of fishy. Egg, it smells like delicious. Hey, if you're talking about delicious, Mike, then how about some of Mark's world famous corn chowder? <laughs> also, Eggie and Bree's real names are Edward and Bella. Yes, Eggie and Bree are named after the characters from Twilight. They have kids at the same time and they're so in love with Twilight, they named their kids Edward and Bella. It's insane. But they go by Eggie and Bree, which are only vaguely close to Edward and Bella, presumably because the writers thought that would be a funny joke, but they had already introduced these characters like six episodes ago, and they were stuck with the nicknames they had given them. I don't know if this is really an example of how season seven is good, but I couldn't not show clips of Eggie and Bree's parents. <laughs> they also have this wild storyline where a bunch of kids from San Francisco move into town. <laughs> Who do these bougie kids think they are? I bet they think they're like way cooler than that just because they're from San Francisco. They better not be joining the dance team mid-season. Because this tech corporation, Golden Gate, has these super secret warehouses they've started building all over town. And the girls find a drone with the corporation's logo on it, and it somehow has footage of the chicken girls dancing from season one? Has this corporation been spying on the Attaway dance team this entire time? And for what reason? So Layla and this boy Darian break into the corporation, hack the mainframe, and find out that this company has secret property value documents for all of the local businesses. Basically, this becomes a gentrification plotline. I wanted to raise my kids somewhere peaceful, somewhere safe, somewhere neighborly. Oh, hey there, Frank. That's why I moved to Attaway. Tree-lined streets, affordable houses, a good school district, and now, thanks to Golden Gate Data, a booming economy. This evil company wants to buy up all of the local property to make even more of their tech warehouses and buy up all of the local single-family homes to rent back to their employees that they plan to bring to Attaway. Rat TV, teaching the youth of today about the housing crisis. But eventually, the evil company does buy up Harmony's house and Harmony is written off the show. Also, if you're wondering how that plotline is resolved, it isn't really. So Junior's is one of the businesses that they're trying to buy, but Bree gets a very successful hat business called Hat Away, which she sells to Golden Gate, and as part of that deal, she convinces them that they should still buy Junior's Cafe, but keep his rent low. And all the other businesses are quietly bought off screen, I guess. You see, I was all in on this new poultry gang until season 10 happened. In season 10, the chicken girls are starting high school. They're hyped to be on the JV dance team, which exists now. And then the next 10 episodes are entirely focused on Simone's cousin, who we've never seen before. This 22 year old who I'm pretty sure is like a dancer online, but she's playing a 15 year old among actual 14 and 15 year olds. And there's also a bunch of other characters we have never seen. The chicken girls are still there supposedly, but they are 
basically absent from 90% of season 10. They'll occasionally cut to them being like, mm, man, high school is so tough, especially when we're not the main characters anymore. Just me, our high school is really hard. I go to deal my math test. I wish I could help out, but my plate's pretty full. Gotta get to student government. We meet in, oh gosh, five minutes. I gotta go too. I got detention for being on my phone in history. Halfway through, Simone, who's kind of like the closest thing we have to Harmony now, starts cheating in math and buys test answers from one of the new characters. But even that isn't like really focused on Simone. It's mostly about tension between these other new random characters we don't care about. The transition between season six and season seven at least made some sense, even though they didn't have the original Chicken Girls graduate or move away. They did at least try and signal to the audiences that the girls are getting older. They're preparing for college. They're like all focused on their SATs and that's why they don't have exciting plot lines anymore. And you have this scene where Rhyme gives Harmony the old chicken girls bracelets and is like, here, form your own chicken girls gang. Harmony and some of the characters from Manny have existed in this universe prior. So it's not totally shocking to build up some of these characters. But season 10 of the chicken girls, they just totally gave up on this idea of passing down to the next generation. The new characters in season 10 are older. Actually, they're basically the same age the original Chicken Girls are, and we're supposed to believe that they've been here the entire time. They also <laughs> claim that the OG Chicken Girls, specifically Rhyme, Ellie, and Birdie, were legends to them because they changed the dance team. Attaway Dance is an institution. Have you even heard of the Chicken Girls? You are aware Simone is my cousin, right? Here's the thing. This school used to live and breathe dance. Rhyme, Ellie, Quinn, Birdie. I know those names mean nothing to you, but <sighs> we worshiped them. Even though they never won a championship, Power Surge <laughs> won a championship. And Ellie was the only chicken girl who was ever on the high school dance team. And that was only for like one semester. They do try and retcon that Birdie was somehow on this dance team off screen that we never saw. But why would a group of middle school girls be legendary to them? And if they're so legendary, why do they not care that like Simone and her group of friends are the new chicken girls? And yes, at the end of season 10, this random group of girls Become the new chicken girls. What happened to Simone, Bree, Layla, Claire? Who's to say? They did have one spinoff called Chicken Girls Forever Team about Simone, Claire, Bree, and Layla. It's post Harmony leaving, but pre season 10. And you would think that that spinoff would maybe explain how these character arcs are completed and why they're almost entirely absent from a show that they were the main characters of. But no, it basically only exists as an advertisement for Lego Mario. Honestly, I'm on the 10 year old fan side this time. What the hell? You can't just keep replacing the chicken girls with no in-universe explanation. Just start a different show about high schoolers if the chicken girl's name means absolutely nothing anymore. It's like if in the final season of Friends, the show just became about Rachel's cousin who we've never seen before. And maybe one out of the 22 episodes, Ross and Rachel stop in to be like, bazinga. Quite honestly, I was hurt, shocked, and betrayed. And yet I cannot wait for season 11. So what now? At this point, I've watched all I can watch, at least while still being able to maintain my sanity. But is Chicken Girls good? Did you watch it? Mm -hmm. I don't know. There were plenty of things I liked about the Chicken Girls. One thing I really haven't gotten to mention is that there is a lot more queer representation on this show than a lot of traditional cable media that I've seen. And for the most part, the queer characters are just like any of the other characters. They have relationship drama, they have school drama, they just happen to be a queer character. I'm into girls, not boys. What? Whoa, for real? Dude, be cool. I hope this doesn't change anything. Well, why would it change anything? Seriously, you're a girl. I also think that as Brad TV grew and got more and more popular, there was more of an effort to have more diverse characters generally. There are also genuine moments where the show is funny, touching, charming. There are also way more moments where the show is unintentionally funny and charming, but I, I still enjoy that. I mean, if I had a kid, I'd let them watch the show. I think there's a lot of outright harmful stuff for kids on YouTube, and I don't think this is one of them. I think it's, it's just kind of lazy, but there is something that keeps me from giving it that total seal of approval. When I was watching the Chicken Girls docuseries, some of the original Chicken Girls actors were asked if they related to their characters. And Dylan, the actor who played Kayla, said this. I would say long, like a long time ago, I was very similar to her. I love dancing. Dancing was my number one thing, but I think we have some differences now. I was very confident when I was young. 
And I think growing up to be in this kind of world, I've kind of lost that confidence. Hopefully I can get that back. Um, but I think, I think playing this character again would be really helpful really helpful. This show and this channel almost entirely stars young kids and teenagers. And they're not just any young kids or teenagers, they're social media stars. These kids are growing up in the public eye on set, off set, all the time. There's just something about that that doesn't feel so good. I know that there are a ton of child actors out there, there are tons of shows on the Disney Channel or Nickelodeon that also have an entirely like children-based cast and I don't know, maybe it's worth questioning those things as well. And I know for the most part, even without Brat TV, these kids would still grow up on social media as huge influencers with the world looking at them. But now there's this company, Brat TV, whose whole business model seems to be profiting off of these kids growing up in the public eye. And that just feels kind of icky to me. But I also want to make clear that as far as I know, none of these kids have had a bad thing to say about their time on Brat, and I don't think it's helpful to label something as traumatic or negative for someone if they themselves aren't saying that. Honestly, I really don't think I have an answer, but I do think that as things like Brat TV maybe become more commonplace, as young social media stars continue to be major profit sources for brands and for their parents, we should have some awareness of that happening and the impact that it might be having on these kids. And I just hope that these kids' well-being are the central focus of any project they're involved in. Didn't exactly plan on landing on a, such a serious note, but that has been my journey with the Chicken Girls. And even now, there's still so many wild plot lines and moments I did not include in this video, so please feel free to add your favorite out of context Chicken Girls moments down below. And if you've watched this and you're crazy enough to watch all the Chicken Girls after this, best of luck to you. Also, exciting channel news, I have a Patreon now if you want to support me over on there. I'm going to be uploading monthly bonus content. Right now I have a video where I give some of my friends bar exam questions and also just show y'all random videos I like on the internet. And you can also watch me on Twitch Tuesdays and Thursday nights from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Or if you don't want to do any of those things, that's cool. If you like this video, feel free to like, comment, subscribe, and I'll see y'all in the next one. Bye. Great. My work's done. I'll be in the supply closet if you need me.